So moving right along to our next speaker, I want you all to get ready to meet the ultimate multi-talented powerhouse, John Falcara. I hope I say your last name correctly. John is no ordinary entrepreneur. He is a serial entrepreneur with a passion for science, innovation, and pushing the boundaries of human potential. Armed with a biotechnology background from MIT and a wealth of knowledge in biochemistry, genetics, and immunology, John is a true Renaissance figure. But that's not all. John is also an, on, an endurance athlete, a brain conditioning expert, and a master of neurosciences. He is the CEO at Biohackers Magazine, which he acquired in 2021, and he's also known in the industry as Cyborg Gangs. As if it weren't enough, he's also an accomplished author with neuroscience calisthenics, Hijack Your Body Clock, under his belt. He, his impressive accolades include being recognized as a top 10 entrepreneurs to follow in 2021, top 10 motivational influencers in 2020 and 21, and top 10 athletes, Instagram influencers of 2020. Jean's brainchild, Cyborg Gains, is making waves as the world's first human optimization platform, fusing functional neuroscience with sports and fitness, with a focus on neuroplasticity, biohacking, science, cognitive functions, technology, and nature. Jean is redefining physical performance and promoting healthier living. So get ready to be inspired by the boundless energy and innovation by Jean. I'm Jean, but not the same Instagram and press and stuff like that. But I'm just here to talk about um, the art of injuries in general. And it's actually the story of my life, part of it. It's the way that I've learned to master the endurance and then move to sports and even in business, in relationship, or learning. So endurance in general is not just like running a marathon. Of course it is uh, some sort of injury. It's not like uh, just making the quick cold play or staying four hours with your thought. That's a difficult uh, thing to do. Or 10 days with a broken femur. Or doing what I do when I'm clutch. I'm kidding, it's not true, huh? <laughs> but I can do it with two hours. So what happened? A while ago, I was in Canada. As you see my accent, I'm not from Cuba. And I'm not from Miami here, but now I am. And I was in Canada, and I'm not even from Canada. I was born in France, Italian born, short, short story on that. So I was in Canada, and I was uh, looking at my new snowmobile that I just acquired, and it was cold, but no snow. And I was looking at the lake, and I was just like, ah, damn it, I really need to find this new toy, like a kid, like every guy is. If I was a girl, I would have been way more clever, but I was not. I can change the future, but for now, I'm Gio. So, it was super cold during the night, and it was raining during the day. I see, I look at my snowmobile, I go like, ah, I'm gonna go for doing some stuff. That's my daughter. So I go on my snowmobile and start doing donuts. And donuts and donuts and donuts. And suddenly, I learned that I can fly, but I didn't know how to land and I broke my femur. So, because in my life, I never had any broken bones, in my mind, it was literally impossible to have the broken bone. And I was convinced that it was not a broken bone. So, it was, remember, 29th of December, I didn't want to go back to the city, two hours away, and I stayed home. And I actually tried to implement by locking stuff, all art, sauna, some sort of movement, light movement. Ended up 10 days with a broken bone. My father in law is a doctor, and he was like, if your leg is shorter on one side, you definitely have a problem, and you need to go to the hospital. I was like, no, it's not. Got okay. <laughs> it fixed, okay? <laughs> um, but I sit there, and in my protocol, I found out that there is technique to master endurance and there's protocols. It seems to be obvious, but sometimes, you know, we don't think about it. How do you build endurance? <coughs> what are the uh, milestones you need to implement to get there? So, can anyone tell me what is the difference between cold feet, a broken bone, and your thoughts? What do they do? You want to? You have an answer. Pain. They generate pain. What is pain? 
I'm not gonna go scientist too much because she said way too much stuff about my background, so I don't wanna be complicated, but pain in general follows a certain pattern. And if you understand the pattern of pain, you understand how to control it. And at the end of the day, if it's psychological, psychological pain or physical pain, it's still a signal. The brain reacts exactly the same for both signal. The trigger is a bit different from psychological to the physical pain because the physical is like from touch and the nerve system, but the reaction in the brain is pretty much similar. So at the end of the day, if you know that it's just a signal, since it's a signal, you can control it. So I was trying to control my pain. And remember, when you have a broken bone, your pain is gradual. Start from really painful, where I couldn't walk, I couldn't move, to even more painful, because your body sends a signal stronger and stronger if you don't take action to fix the problem. So I was implementing stuff, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go into my hot baths, I'm going to do sauna, I'm going to do cold, I'm going to do meditation, and whatsoever. And I found out that you need certain thing to control that pain and to build up your endurance. And then the pain doesn't exist anymore. And those things are the physical fitness, of course, you need that. The mental conditioning, uh, setting some goals in which you're going to do. And of course, one of the most underrated things is breathing but what do you do we call this thing how do you put them together if you are capable of taking them separately understanding them and then making them working together you can synchronize everything to get into flow state means like from the focus on your energy uh, the, the uh, sound signal and i'm going to explain you why and then his breathing. Of course, everyone that does breath, um, uh, breath control and uh, uh, box breathing or things like that knows that even to get into meditation, that breathing is the technique to get into flow states in a way or the other. But you need to combine all of them. Why I'm saying that? It's because I found out at that time that the only thing that you need to put together to get into the deepest flow state is the frequencies of music your breathing and your focus, your brain, the whole synchronized together puts you in a deep flow state. Most people are not capable of standing a flow state more than 20 minutes. Some runners, there is one in the uh, room actually, but some runners can do like four hours of flow state. I can master flow states and stay on flow state for almost a day if I have the tools to do that. And I just want to share with you how this technique helped me to stay 45 minutes in water. And I'm gonna kick the ass off. I'll just do it. Wim off? <laughs> Soon. <laughs> As time, I'm gonna leave up to 130, so. Anyway, so breathing is the one step that you need to implement to get into those two states, okay? Because, Disturbing. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, yeah. We all we all think that our breath control our uh, our brain control our breathing, but it's the reverse actually. Studies have shown that it's completely the reverse because our brain is like today with all these things, it goes all over the place. The neurons are firing in a way or the other. They're never synchronized together. The only way that you can synchronize the neuron in your brain is using sound and breathing. And both combined put actually your breathing, your uh, neural align and synchronizing with everything you are doing. So I'm not gonna tell you what it is about breathing. No one know what it is. Four in, four, uh, uh, four old, exhale, four ends. And then we were talking about that with that as before. I was saying like, I'm using box breathing in a way. And actually on the first step of my box breathing, what I do to get um, my heartbeat lower, faster, I do a double inhale. I'm good. <laughs> and, uh, and then you do the box breathing for a couple of minutes. So here's the tool. You want to stay 45 minutes in the cold water? How do I do that? Simple, box breathing. One playlist, remember, Spotify, whatever you take, make a playlist of your favorite song. Remember every single 
one that you put there. So don't put a playlist of 100 different sound, and uh, but maybe limit it to 10, 15, depends on your working memory. But if you choose to go like, let's pretend 10, you choose 10 of your favorite music. For me, it's techno kind of house music, deep house, because I was a DJ once in my life. She forgot to say that. And uh, then you remember the title, you remember the length of each one. Know that, okay? You have your playlist, you have your headset, with the fox breathing, you step into the water, you immerse up to the shoulders. Starting by doing double inhale, box breathing, music is on. Now, try to remember what is the title of the first song that takes your attention somewhere. Because you are breathing, it's already like focusing, and because you are putting your attention to the music you're listening, and trying to remember the title, your attention will right on the spot on focus. You're almost in the full state at that time. If now, during this time, a second song goes on and stops, you have to remember how long was the first song, what is the title of the second one. And now, what he's doing, it's mathematical processing. You don't have to go to the MIT to get there. There, everyone can do it. It's just neuroplasticity applied to memory. So. Mathematical, mathematical processing makes you put it, uh, putting in perspective those two titles that you have and those two length. So let's pretend I have a song of 3 minutes and 20 seconds, Shiro, and I have a second one that is 4 minutes and 10 seconds. I make calculation easy. So I'm putting my mind into thinking what is the total in terms of minutes and seconds that I'm in the water there. Too many people make the mistake to have a timer in front of them and looking at the timer or looking at the clock and trying to stay in the water, they are all out before the 12 minute because the 12 minute your brain goes on a reptilian mode and you go out of the water by reflex and if you are lucky to go a 12 minute. So those things cumulate and keep, keep combining them in, in, in your head like the third, the fourth, the fifth and you realize that you are so deeply into flow state that it's been 30 minutes that you are into the water. Of course you feel shivers. When you feel the shivers that are like not terrible enough, you better get out. But if you if you if you build up that resilience and that endurance, you can stay longer. And the 30 minute goes to 35, 40, 45, with off an hour and 10, I think, soon. What is the advantage of that? Many people will say like, okay, why you stay 45 minutes? And that was a question at the uh, biohacking conference. Uh, people were making, so a company was making uh, cool punches. <laughs> and uh, they go like, oh, would you like to jump on uh, the cold plunge? And I go like, yeah, well, but I, I don't have 45 minutes. And the guy was like, why you stay 45 minutes in the water? That's a legit question. Think about it, why? You could stay two, you could stay 12, you have some good response for your body that is already triggered. But if you stay 45 minutes or 30 minutes, those are the response that you're getting way more profound than the one you're getting for two minutes. And this is why I'm putting the endurance in, in place for 45 minutes. It's just not for the fun of uh, showing off and, and being there. It's really for the benefit that brings it. Even if today there is not enough studies backing up cold plunges in general, but for the long cold plunges, there is more than for the short cold, cold plunges. And by the way, that, that's me before. No kidding. I went to Dr. Bowen for my hair. <laughs> but no joke, those are the benefit. And in fact, actually, when you build your endurance, Typically, okay, you can go into cold plunges, but you can run longer distances. You can go into learning faster. And as Jim Wick about it, he's been telling you that. But the combination of getting you to build up for endurance, it's only based on three factors. The focus, the breathing, and the sound. And everyone that is a musician or a composer, or just a fan of great music can tell you that Every time you listen to this music, you can feel those frequencies on your skin. And trust me, when I get into water, into deep focus, I can literally put the heartbeat of 128 BPM of the music with 
my heartbeat and I can feel on my skin the release of the neurotransmitter going by flu because they don't go constantly, they go by flu. And just by that feeling, you get an addicted to it. Seems like apparently it's kind of a drug. I'm a junkie. Whatever you do, remember that peak performance, it's very simple. It's attainable, it's like for everyone. Where I think the most, the biggest benefit that you can get is probably the learning because knowledge is power. So if you apply those techniques of hyperfocus for adding more knowledge, more uh, information, and then use them for improving your life, you're gonna live longer, better, fitter, healthier. That's what we do. Uh, we launched this movement that is called Life Spanning because I think it's some things, but I think we want to extend it to everyone. One wants to live longer, wants to have access to everything. Those are free. Wow. 10 box subscription for my Spotify. That's about it. I think that everyone can be can improve his life without spending too much money. I have huge respect for hyperbrake chamber, but it, they're expensive to have and everybody cannot afford that. So try to put in place those protocols that are open. And I'm glad to share uh, my own protocol with anyone. Just text me, email me, call me, beat me up. My That's all I have to say because I don't want to uh, challenge your own endurance tonight, but today, but I'm going to challenge you for a question. Please, yes. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, I actually train people to get into cryo chambers. So yes. they get one I lived in Canada, <laughs> and on that day, uh, I was training outside by minus 40 Celsius, it's like minus 30 something Fahrenheit, I think. I guess. Wait. Yeah, more. Like yeah. 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 Only negative 40. I was training outside barefoot on chest to expose myself to cold. The cold in the water is a bit different because you're not moving. And there's tricks too, like when you're in a cold clutch, for example, you don't put your hands in the water because of the internal receptor you have on your hands, your palm. Yeah, the feet have to be flat on the, on the thing. And at the end of the cold clutch, you can put your face in the water to stop the reflex of winning to go out. You cannot do that in a chamber air or mechanical cold, the benefit are the same. But I think that it's harder to be in, yeah. Actually, it's harder to be in the water. If you move, if you don't move, it's not harder. Yeah, because when you're in the water, your skin tends to, to, to make a protection layer of like energy. You, you're spending your energy to make a protection layer of air that is covering your skin. So if you don't move that much, that protective layer is an insulator. You cannot do that in something that curves cold because it's always moving it. And so the trick is like move the less possible, like kind of a meditation stuff uh, in cold water. But uh, that's, that's a true fact and it's backed by your science.